Right, you're very welcome along this Monday morning to OTBAM. It's Jerry Gilroy and Owen Sheehan with you all the way through until 10. We'd love to hear from you if you're a Mayo fan, licking your wounds. If you're a Tyrone fan and you're awake, fair play to you. Uh, 0879 180 180 is the WhatsApp number. Of course, you can always get us on the YouTube comments or you can get us at Off The Ball AM. If you're a Galway Camogie fan, if you're a Cork Camogie fan and you're upset about stuff, then we can be your forum today. Let us help you get through whatever it is that you need to get through. Uh, as ever, OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. Good morning, so start with Gillette. Um, Owen, are we going to talk here or are we just going to get straight into the performance rankings because we don't want to give too much away? Well, people know that in the performance rankings we start with the bad performances first. So do we give Tyrone their place at the top of the show here this morning or do we say, nah, let's postpone the Tyrone chat for like 20 minutes' time? How how concerned are you about the re-emergence of the Tyrone ghosts? <laughs> quite, quite. I think that there was a, a lot of hallmarks of the 2000s from Saturday Night's performance, from their season as a whole, really, since they got out of Ulster. The two games that they played really were very 2000s Tyrone, weren't they? And it just doesn't help those ghosts when it comes to seeing Brian Duhur there on the sideline. And they even listening to... Young Canavan. And Young Canavan. Yeah, certainly. Uh, they, they, there was huge hallmarks of of the 2000s team just a, a really really top quality outfit that I think in fairness this team has automatically got more credit than the team of the 2000s like immediately I find I think over the decade obviously that Tyrone team managed to in your circles to, to, to get more in credit. your circles a lot of us thought that that Tyrone team were astonishing from the get go but anyway go on no I, I just I just think that there is a, an element to this team where it's like there's been an, an immediate change when it comes to the management to the style of play earlier this year and this sort of arrival is certainly after they, they beat Kerry in the semi-final where there was an, an expectation that they were going to be a great team. I think a lot of people still could have tallied that with also tipping Mayo on, on Saturday but uh, as we'll get to in just a moment it certainly didn't go Mayo's way. Um, did you watch the game in Kerry? I did. I, I drove all the way down from home to Kerry because I couldn't, I couldn't be around Dublin when... Um, when this was going down. Just in case Mayo won. Just in case Mayo won. Okay, that's good to get that on the record. <laughs> and it's okay, now you can actually come out and unleash all of your anti-Mayo feelings. No, 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 not, not at all. I just... You I patronise them and... and no, oh, absolutely. Attaboy, there, don't worry. There'll be no, there be no patronising of, we'll of Mayo We'll be back next morning. year for the 72nd. Uh, and but, what, what, when... I don't know if you watched it in the pub or not, but if... Um, no. Okay, so the... Is there... A, a, like, this is... Could they both lose territory for Kerry supporters, Right. Uh, you know, if the if the ground could swallow up both teams here and there'd be no All Ireland champions this year, we'd be happy. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, if that was an option. But it, it, I think it was very much everybody wanted Mayo to win, and I think Kerry were on board with that. Like, I mean, you could tell us better here. You were in the stadium, you were around Jones's Road. I presume Dublin on Saturday was a coronation for Mayo. Uh, Pre match, yeah. I mean, and uh, like that was the type of thing that you would always. Uh, uh, there are ghosts for anybody who's been a supporter of a team who's been beaten in an Ireland final. So there was definitely, um, afterwards people were talking, that was very like 1998, wasn't it? Like, do you know what? Yes, it was. <laughs> yes, it was. Uh, the clearly superior team won clearly in a very easy manner in the end. And uh, people didn't see that in advance. The ambush was there all along, hiding in plain sight. Um, so yeah, I like, I'm just I'm very interested to see how people rate this Tyrone team. You were already looking at the odds for next year. How are they ranked? Must they're, be number one, right? Yeah, you would have thought so. They're ten to one. They're fourth placed for next year. Like that has uh, certainly been the the tone uh, regarding that the last couple of year a couple of, couple of weeks I should say that people feel that Mayo and Tyrone have been unfairly written off and everybody had crowned Dublin or Kerry when it came to this year's All Ireland Championship and people were like, "Ah, you stupid Egypt! You knew you didn't know that these two be- that these were actually the two best teams in the country." But as it turns out, uh, they're still not being rated as the two best teams in the country for next year. In fact, Mayo are being rated ahead of Tyrone in terms of their chances of winning next year. So going back to back for Tyrone has previously been an issue for them. When we get into the conversations over the next little while, I think they'll be absolutely right there. I think there's a number of relevant conversations around Tyrone that don't involve Tyrone, though. I think it comes down to a championship structure as well next year because certainly when you look at it, there are uh, there is a system there that will suit other counties more than the current system does. Not that this suited Tyrone or anything like that. You still have a knockout championship where you have to come through the toughest of the four provinces. Absolutely so, didn't, yeah. Uh, like, I mean, the, 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 there are a number of fascinating angles when it comes to analysing 2022 already, and, and that's just Tyrone. And then, 
of course, there's just the added motivation for all these hungry teams, you know, do, do, do all these teams want it more next year because Tyrone ha- have their All-Ireland already. I think, uh, I mean, we can we can get into that sort of nonsense talk this morning and that's what we're here for, right? Yeah, and all winter as well. That's the joy of it. It is 7.35 this morning. This is OTB AM. It's time for the performance rankings. You know, that wasn't an All-Ireland winning performance. Probably should have won the game based on the second half performance. Is it a step too far to say it was the performance so far of the World Cup? Maybe not. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette. I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head. That performance is was just lacked that intensity. So every Monday morning we go through the green, the red and the amber of the sporting weekend. And it was always going to be green or red for the green and red of Mayo uh, this week I, I mean um, it was never going to be Amber I guess was it I thought they were going to win and I thought that if they showed up they had a really good chance of winning and I expected them to show up because they showed up in 2016 they showed up in 2017 maybe last year wasn't an amazing performance but it was still better than the performance they put in on Saturday I felt I thought they were really poor I thought that there was this old sense of performance anxiety and a lack of a marquee forward conversation that, that came up once again, the conversations yeah. we were having before Killian O'Connor uh, cemented himself as one of the greatest forwards of his generation. It felt there were echoes of that, but it also felt we had got back to a point where Mayo were underperforming in the final. And I didn't see that coming because I felt that a big part of their mental block involved Dublin and they had got over that hurdle in the semi-final. So I thought they were, there was a bit of the banishing of ghosts already done. And I thought that, 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 that they would have been, they would have played in a, in a free way didn't seem that way on Saturday. I actually think last year's performance was much worse because they conceded a goal after nine seconds or eleven seconds. So, um, I, not to get to, to get bogged down in it, but it is back to back, as you rightly point out, back to back All Ireland final performances where they haven't produced what we think is their best football. Um, all week long, when we were previewing this game, we talked about the relative strength of the bench. Like Kyle McShane scores a beautiful goal with his first touch, and Mayo don't get anything off their bench comparatively. Uh, the chaos that Mayo like to bring, um, the the better analysts are like, well, that's all well and good in the middle of a game, but if that's your game plan, then actually it can become counterproductive. Somebody, um, one of the papers has printed a Paul Galvin tweet saying he wouldn't have been able to play half forward in that game because all the backs are running into your space, taking all your space. Uh, you know, where's the opportunity for the half forwards to create? I think we've we've got now the the holy trinity or the full house of self-inflicted wounds by Mayo in an All-Ireland final. It's the red card when the game is there for them. Just just maintain your superiority. The two own goals in a game where Dublin don't perform in an All-Ireland final. This thing about the Dubs always were always brilliant on an All-Ireland final day. They always managed the process. They needed two own goals to scrape a draw against, the. it turns out, the best Mayo team of that time. And now the missed penalty. And everybody's like, oh, Tyrone would have won anyway. But I'm not sure Tyrone would have won anyway. The point that Andy Moore was making the whole week was here are two teams who have not got through this next year if Mayo score a penalty against Tyrone in the Ireland final and Tyrone go on to win it we will know that uh, that they would have gone on to win it but this year there was room for someone to put doubt in that Tyrone team's mind there was that moment where Mayo had that opportunity to do it and they couldn't do it and look would Killian O'Connor have nailed the penalty yeah I think he probably would I think, I think we all think Killian O'Connor would have nailed the penalty and that's just going to be a, a harsh thing for them forever. But uh, I think what happens in matches like this is that uh, teams get born and we, we see something forged. And I think now Toronto are going to be around for the next two or three years and they're going to win tight games that champions win, that, that thing that Andy Moran talked about. And Mayo still haven't got that. All the stuff about that this Mayo team haven't had success at underage level and so therefore they don't have ghosts anymore and they don't have baggage. Now they all have baggage. And, I mean, when they overcome that, it's going to be the most remarkable thing of all time. There are a number of things that they got wrong on Saturday, obviously. The, when it comes to the substitutions and the decisions on the sideline, it did feel that Horn absolutely nailed it in the semi-final and something just didn't go right on Saturday. Obviously, they'll have had more information than we'll have had spectating, but I'm not sure what your view on the Portugal Horror substitution was. Like, that, that for me is... That for me puts him right into the bad this week because that's a sort of self-inflicted wound for me right after he makes this long busting run up the pitch the sort of run that kind of disrupts a very well organised defence and, and like I, I, don't, I don't even want to call it a well organised defence a well organised 
collection of defenders is probably a better way of putting it, like top quality defenders who are doing a brilliant man-to-man job in pretty much all their defensive positions. So when you've got a man running towards you and you've got to step off your man a little bit to try and stop this incoming train, that causes doubt, that causes a, a little bit of chaos in that Tyrone defence, which perhaps they wouldn't have liked. And I thought that if you're making that sort of lung-busting effort up the pitch, maybe he knew he was getting taken off and maybe he knew that was the last effort he had. As I say, there, there is more. Inf- we don't have all the information available. But it just seemed like a very unusual substitution. Like we'll get into Aidan O'Shea a little bit later on as well. And of course, there's been uh, a lot of people coming to the defence in terms of personal attacks and all that. And that is all right and good. And of course, he handled uh, a good bit of ball in that second quarter of the game. But I thought he, he just didn't work again on, on Saturday in a, in a really big game. And I thought that same substitution that, that Horan made, maybe not the same personnel-wise, but taking off Aidan O'Shea in the semi-final, I thought that... I, th- I thought that was coming. I was like, this is, this is only a matter of time before he makes the exact same change. So I was surprised when that didn't happen and I was surprised when Portugal Horror did get taken off. So I, I think that kind of hammers home a little bit of misery for Mayo. Yeah, so a horror was Marco McCurry, is that? like? Yeah. And certainly that seems to it. And so McCurry played well and scored and yeah. was creating chances. But like, um, that's going to happen. Like, Clifford played well and scored, but that was because somebody is going to be doing the scoring. Like, I don't know, maybe, maybe you're right, maybe there was an injury or something or there was a knock that we didn't see. But certainly, if if you want your uh, chaos and war to be happening, he is a man who's bringing chaos and war. Like, Oshie Mullen is the one who ends up getting caught underneath McShane for the goal. Um, and Oshie Mullen is going to go on to have one of the great Mayo Gaelic football careers. There's no doubt about it, but he looked a little bit lacking in sharpness, as you would do, having had the injury and not been at full tilt for the last while. Um, and I don't. They were obviously weren't going to take him off. But I, look, on on the on the sideline, it definitely seems like what Tyrone had uh, trumped what Mayo had, and that's going to be very hard for James Horn to take, given the progress that this team have made. The other side about Mayo, and look, we're we're talking about them now because we'll talk about Tyrone later on, is that uh, there are some. I mean, you have better access to this information than most people. But the talk around Mayo is that some of those kids that are coming through are really good. They brought off, they brought on a young a young fella. That many players didn't. Many of the rest of the country didn't know with the Orm. Say it again. Orm. Orm. So yeah, I, I, I'm like, I mean, the, the, I, I'd heard in Mayo during the week that this guy was potentially with a shout of starting uh, the game. I, had, I hadn't seen him play against Leitrim earlier in the year. Tommy had. He was saying that. Uh, maybe in a couple of years' time, once he fully bulks up, he'll be a good player. But there's like real excitement about him, and I think that's kind of been the trend for this Mayo team over the last two seasons, in particular, where players have been coming out of the blue, and all of a sudden they've arrived and they've been really, really good pretty quickly. And I think Mullen and O'Hara fall into that category actually. That right away that they're, they're not at this point they're like your first two names alongside Lee Keegan and in, in your defensive team sheet but kind of when they first come along the scene you're like who's this guy and they've come up to speed really quickly that's the real positive for Mayo is that yeah like so again to go back to I think it was Conor McKeown on the papers a couple of weeks ago talking about when Mayo get annihilated by the dubs in was it Northern semi-final or was it a, was it a semi-final 19 yeah it... and if you were to say at that point that Mayo would be in an all-around final uh, with a chance of winning it quickly everybody would have said you're doting because that team yeah. is finished and it's finished for the long f- and actually what they've done mm. is they've rebuilt so you know again you look at the age profile of the teams Tyrone are more advanced they've got more around that 25 27 29 30 than uh, than Mayo do and so maybe seasoned by another 18 months maybe next year isn't the year and it's the year after that this Mayo team actually reaches its full expression but by that point Kevin McLaughlin you know maybe he's gone in two years time uh, is Lee Keegan coming back next year I don't know I really hope he does because mm. his performance was absolutely sensational in terms of being somebody like I don't want I don't want this to be a pile on a mayor right because it's, it's very easy in the aftermath of that to say ah there you go stereotypical but every time something really bad happened they came back and scored a point like, like a Lee Keegan point the two goals they came back and scored the next point immediately afterwards yeah. it was like what is undead can never be killed what is, whatever that line was uh, <laughs> um, and I, like the, their zombie quality is actually something to be celebrated and admired and at the same time oof, this is going to be the heartbreaking defeat that is very hard for them to come back from and 
I, I, I kind of go along with that idea as well that there might actually be brighter days pretty soon as well because if they manage to get this far with this generation that's coming up not actually fully formed yet then what can they possibly do next of course I, I think that the championship might get a little bit more get even more competitive over the next couple of seasons so it might be difficult for them to get to that level but I, like it's in the context of Saturday, this is obviously desperately disappointing for Mayo. They were favourites for an All-Ireland final. They underperformed on the day. But this wasn't some sort of last chance for them. Of course, as you point out, this the, the problem for Mayo now is that this adds a layer of baggage for the first time ever to, for a lot of these players. Because for me, they looked a, a little bit carefree in the semi-final in a brilliant way, in an absolutely brilliant way. And now this adds that little layer of, hmm, we've, we've been here in a final that we were expected to win and we just didn't show up. But you're right about what you say about Tyrone as well. Like Enda McGinley made the point on the show yesterday that actually this Tyrone team is more experienced than the Mayo team. Yes, if you look at County Mayo versus County Tyrone, of course the County of Mayo has more baggage than the County of Tyrone. But not these players pre-match, not these players. These players are younger than the Tyrone players. These Tyrone players, in fact, have played in the 2018 final, uh, a lot of them, and and have been desperately disappointed from that. And they've managed to come back. So there, there is a difference here. And of course, this is all, I guess, revisionism after the fact. But... Maybe we should have seen this coming a little clearer. I, I know, in fairness, the, the prevailing analysis before the game was this is a 50-50 game. And I don't think anybody was really saying that Mayo were definitely going to win this. People just had a hunch that Mayo were going to win this. But maybe if we dug down a little bit deeper, the, the experience that Tyrone has and uh, the age profile that they have and the, the bench that they have, I guess those are the sort of things that definitely get you over the line in a, in a tight game. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I was predicting on this show that Toronto were going to win. And just to, I want to put that on the record here. You were like, oh, no, 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 I think it's going to be Mayo. And then I kind of, um, I wavered a bit at the last minute and went for the draw on Friday night show, which I shouldn't have done. I was just, I got... Well, I got why did you waver? What, what, what changed your mind? swept away by the conspiracy theories. Well, because I wanted, I wanted to manifest it into, I wanted us all as a country to manifest another week of this. Wouldn't that have been great? Wouldn't another week of us talking nonsense about Mayo against Toronto, except with... 97 minutes of evidence have been fairly sensational. Yeah, no, it would have been absolutely. I, and I like I, it felt a little bit disappointing that we didn't get the grandstand finish. It does. It does. Uh, what I what I do think about this is that if uh, if these two teams played a best of seven or a best of nine, it would be a smashing victory for Tyrone over that series at the moment. That these two teams are actually that there's significant daylight between them, and that that's evident now as it wasn't pre-game and I think like mm. I think that those final 20 minutes are, are when that Tyrone team are in many ways post the penalty and I, I do actually think that the penalty is a huge moment because it gives Tyrone the sense that well now <laughs> well now this is right there for us and also the quality of their bench becomes so much more evident at that stage uh, I'd love to see them gone behind just to see what they're like when they go behind it, it, like in, in the business end of the game obviously uh, yeah because like, they were you know obviously two points down is it the first team since 2004 2005 to um, concede the first two scores and to go on and win the game so oh, all the signs were there for Mayo mm. yeah they, they certainly were but I, I kind of agree with you on that as well that there, were, there was a bit of a gap between them at the end and uh, like I, I just I couldn't really identify that beforehand uh, look uh, Malachi Clerkin's piece uh, the the subheading is Hoare needs to find a role for O'Shea and end his torment once and for all the role is full forward with Killian O'Connor playing off him isn't it and and Tommy Gold's playing off him so you've got a three man full forward line and like I, I think Killian O'Connor's absence is so important because he's got that hard tackling edge that kind of yeah. plays on the edge sets the tone he's the one and they didn't really have that in the full forward line. They have a lot of nice forwards who are young and are coming into themselves. And up against Tyrone, there's nothing nice about those Tyrone lads. <laughs> like, they've come up uh, iron sharpens iron in the club game in Tyrone, and they know exactly how they're supposed to tackle, and they know exactly how to deal with that. So, um, yeah, like, I, uh, they, they, there's, there's something there. Like, I, I do think players like, like Conroy have got that edge this season and like the amount of work he kind of went through in the middle third the other day and definitely in the semi-final against Dublin kind of like alright this guy's got that hard tackling element that you need to be a full forward player for, for Mayo because that was the whole thing about their run to the final last year was the, all the turnovers Killeen O'Connor and Aidan O'Shea were involved in up front and I think Tommy Conroy had, had kind of contributed to that this year as well but like you add Killeen O'Connor to the mix there it is an exciting team and, and they would kind of get found out without Killeen O'Connor at the weekend but why didn't they go route one a little bit more in the second half I don't know 
I don't know, it doesn't make any sense. And as somebody pointed out, it was actually, it ended up being Aidan O'Shea kicking high balls into where Aidan O'Shea should have been. Like, the, the system broke down because the system hadn't been ingrained enough or clearly defined where, you know, we talk about the identity of teams. Tyrone's identity is, is very, very clear. And we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. Yeah, just one other thing we want to get to in the bad uh, this morning uh, in the red, uh, Irish rugby. Uh, you might have seen this uh, yesterday, uh, uh, an apology being issued from the IRFU and Leinster Rugby over uh, an unacceptable error that forced teams to change in pretty appalling conditions, I think it's fair to say. We have um, uh, footage up here on screen, uh, nothing like getting forced to change in these conditions with rats running around. This was uh, at Energy at Park yesterday at an Interpro's doubleheader. Um, like this is a Connacht player who'd, who had shared that footage and you can see there that they were like absolutely horrific conditions that they were forced to change. And as I said, the mention of rats there as well, which you couldn't actually identify in the video. There's an IRFU statement that came out saying that they would like to apologise to players, management and representatives of Connacht and Ulster. Sorry for the inconvenience caused by an unacceptable error in relation to the positioning of temporary changing facilities. They said due to current government guidelines, changing facilities are not available for amateur rugby teams. These temporary facilities should have been set up in a more appropriate area. The IRFU and Leinster Rugby are extremely sorry for the inconvenience to the teams and the upset this unacceptable error has caused. Yeah, as somebody made the point, uh, the Tyrone and Mayo lads aren't getting uh, changed down the alleys of Drumcondra. They too are an amateur team, so um, justifiably outrage from people suggesting this would never happen to the men. It's ludicrous to suggest that uh, this is something to do with the amateur stuff. Eventually the IRFU come out and apologise, but it just isn't good enough and everybody knows it's not good enough. And really every time there's like a quantum leap forward for women's sport in Ireland, you still get dragged back in by uh, crap like this. So, um, you know, we're just trying to highlight that this morning. This is still going on. Uh, we will move on to the amber, the meh, the grand and in here we are going with the chasing pack. This is a kind of a, a zoomed out version of, of what the football championship might look like over the next couple of years as a result of what we saw on on Saturday. So I guess like what are, what are the lessons that some of the counties who aren't favourites for the All-Ireland Championship over the next couple of years, what, what are the lessons that they can take away from Tyrone actually uh, prevailing? Like I, I guess what they could take away in a positive sense is that Tyrone won a lot of close matches this year they managed to get to, they managed to, to, to get into a fight with Kerry managed to get into a fight with, with, with Mayo and, and, and win convincingly enough in, in both occasions or look like a much better team you go through their, their Ulster Championship and when it came to the close calls they managed to prevail so getting close to teams is, is obviously the first step and then also the, the kind of from nothing nature of their win it is possible to to kind of get to the promised land from a, from a fairly tough position earlier in the year but I think I'm kind of clutching at straws there at maybe some of the, the positives that other teams can take from this. I think in reality what we have here is an outstanding Tyrone team. And I, like, there was a bit of blowback when I described them as a brilliant team on Twitter on, on Saturday. And I, I think people still have yet to be convinced that this is a brilliant team. People are still pointing to circumstance yeah. for why they won this year. So, like, what, I w- what circumstance though? The fact that like <laughs> McShane, who was a contender for football of the year a couple of years back, wasn't fit enough to start. Well, like, well I mean... Th- that's it and all of a sudden then you have him as an impact sub so like what teams can perhaps not take from this Tyrone uh, setup because this is quite unique to Tyrone to the Tyrone team and to the very top teams is first of all the depth that they have in this squad and as you mentioned there Colin McShane being an impact sub Derek Canavan being an impact sub like that, that is outrageous depth players of that quality to be coming off your bench to finish out an All-Ireland final and All-Ireland semi-final that is the stuff of champions in attack right there They've got a couple of players who are deemed good enough to be professional uh, Australian footballers. Like, I mean, this is uh, like this, this is the level that the likes of McShane and McKenna are operating at. McKenna has succeeded in Australia. He wasn't just a prospect. He was a success story. They've got Brian Dew, who I don't think many counties have uh, a, a man like that on the sideline, a, a success like that on the, the sideline, a winner like that on the sideline. They've got an incredible amount of resources that have been used in the right way, which is important. You can't just throw money at a problem. Like, I mean, the, the, their Garvahi Centre has been the envy of a lot of Ulster over the last little while. Their coaching set up completely, it seems, self-sustained at the moment. Their, their backroom team, all people from Tyrone, even just the way they had to fight to, to get Peter Donnelly back into the SNC uh, set up after the great job he did and then being lured away from Tyrone. Getting him back was important. Getting McKenna back, as I mentioned, was important. Keeping McShane at home. 
everybody is on side, everybody realises the importance that every Tyrone person can play in their success. Maybe that is something that other counties can learn from, actually, rather than being unique to Tyrone. They've got a completely football-obsessed county, and I guess, really, the bottom line here is that this wasn't a very big shock at all. I think the reason why this was a big shock, in we got to put it into context of the year, and I think the COVID situation is still in the minds of people when they're a little bit surprised by what happened on Saturday. And that's fair enough. But I think if we separate that from the team that we're witnessing here and the management and the entire setup in Tyrone GEA, once Dublin got knocked out, I think this wasn't a very big shock at all. I think that, that I think I think COVID is the reason why this is the unlikely win that it is. Yeah, for the chasing pack, I think the ability to get close to Tyrone will give them some hope. I think the chasing pack can also look at what Tyrone did. The uh, the type of defensive system that they have, which isn't the out and out sweepers, which wasn't the really boring let's kick the ball back all the time. It's a, an intelligent iteration. It's smart. It's still aggressive. It's still trying to win games as opposed to not lose them. And that's the sea change in mentality that seems to be with their approach. And you would really hope. I think a lot of teams are doing that. I think Armagh have that. I think Monaghan have that. I think Donegal hopefully will have something that they come back with next year and hopefully get a bit of strength and depth from what happened for them for, for this year as well. And so all of a sudden, all of those counties must be thinking, well, if we can just get out of whatever championship we have... Uh, then we're in with a shout. And the questions about what that championship may actually look like are going to be more important than ever over the next little while because what is it next month? We will discover how exactly it's going to look over the next little while and it's going to be very interesting to see how, how certain parties vote in that because uh, like I, I think no matter what way you paint it up, I think that the current structure, even if you go back to the Super 8 structure, I think it's just harder for Ulster teams to, to survive. I think, of course, if there's a back door and you get knocked out of the Ulster Championship, you're you're all well and good and you can maybe build a bit of momentum through the Super 8s if you get that far. But it's still harder to be an Ulster team. So maybe, the, the I'm not sure, did the Ulster people, the Ulster delegates vote in favour of keeping the Ulster Championship because it's such a great money spinner and genuinely a great championship? Or do they vote to try and bring more parity to the competition? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got to say, I think the Ulster Championship is one of the reasons why Ulster counties have won so few All-Irelands. Like it's it's an immediate war that you have to go through and then you get to the end of the war and everybody's there like, hey, nice to see you. And it's the dubs and it's Kerry. And they're like, happy days. You've all killed each other. They're like, I mean, you can barely walk and you're still playing. Like that's exactly what has happened. If they could just see past it, then this would be a, a new bright dawn for the Ulster counties in like slashing their way through the rest of the country and winning all Ireland's. But... Local rivalries are the things that are most important to people. So, um, I don't know. We'll come back to that because that's um, John Fogarty is out in the papers today that the annual congress that was slated for this month has been put back to October for the GA to give more times to the counties to have a, a think about what's coming next. And we could be going back to 2017. We could be going back to before the Super 8s. We could be going to the Super 8s or we could be going to either of the two new proposals that have been put forward. But they both need a 60% they need to reach more than 60%. And when there's two proposals that are going forward, it's very hard for either of them to reach more than 60%. So, because one of them will be more popular than the other, but it might not be so popular that it gets uh, the, the mandate. And if it doesn't get the mandate, then then there'll be a vote and to go back to the Super 8. And if that doesn't happen, which let's face it, might not happen because mm. a lot of people didn't think the Super 8 is very good. And certainly the way they were constituted with Dublin having two home games, as opposed to everybody else, uh, that wasn't fair and then we go back to 2017 was the 2017 championship really good it wasn't great no wasn't good final great. made a good final but uh, that, was, that was about it yeah like that, that, there is no consensus whatsoever when you look at people talking about this about what, what is actually going to be the best proposal for me it's clear uh, and we've done this on the show before what the best championship proposal is and it's not reconstituting the provinces it's not that one it's the other one it's a plan B I think but I don't see that reflected in GEA circles and people who've who've actually kind of voiced an opinion on it. So maybe they're giving themselves extra time that everybody knows exactly what is best for the GAA over the next couple of years, so that everybody gets behind the thing that 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 needs to happen. Because you're it's like it's it's just it's just not going to be the reality if, if you're going to need sixty percent. So that's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out. Wouldn't it be great if we could see Mayo against Tyrone in a championship match every year? That's what we should be thinking. Like this, the quality of the football was excellent. The the drama was 
like edge of your seat stuff until the penalty miss and the goal got scored and after that it was absolutely clear what was going to happen but um, well, I, still, I still like I mean it's still an enjoyable game like, oh absolutely yeah well, I've just seen people giving out about the quality of the football and you're like oh come on really the athleticism like... and skill that we've seen here is like far superior to the stuff that we saw 20 years ago let alone 40 years ago but, like that's a good opportunity to just like flick on to, to the good here and straight on to Tyrone because we, like I mean, once Potty Hamsey comes up and like fires that one over the bar with the outside of the boot, like that's the moment where if you think that the quality of the game is not at a high enough level, you probably need to park your arguments at that point because I don't know they did it all against Kerry in the semi final. All three of their full back line uh, came up for scores and immediately they set that tone against Mayo, where they have like it is they have it seems like they've taken a, a player like Potty Hamsey. And cloned him thirteen times. That that is what the Tyrone team is. That they like they have kind of everything. That the hard tackling, aggressive nature when they when they don't have the ball, and then this unbelievably skillful ability when they have the ball in hand. And I like, I think it might become a bit of a cliche over the next little while that Tyrone don't get enough credit for the footballers that they are. I hope that it doesn't become the reality because well, I think on now. Saturday night it yeah. proved what a. It's not just the street smarts and the intelligence that they have. To be able to, for, for intelligence to be used to good effect, you need to have incredible footballers. And here's the thing, their footballers are actually better footballers than Mayo's footballers. Uh, that whole kind of, oh, Mayo are a great footballing county, but actually Mayo had the athletes and the workers and Tyrone had the footballers who, had, who were two-footed, who were kicking long-range points, who were finding pockets of space. There's five points that you can think of that were scored by five individuals in the Tyrone team where they manufactured space for themselves or they took what looks like, you know, a oh, low percentage outside of the booth from 40 yards straight over the black spot. Mm. Like, and you never, you actually didn't really think that they were going to go wide. And it's at a, a level that Mayo don't have and that many of the other counties actually don't have. And that's the bit that I think that we need to give Toronto credit for. Like, I know it's been, we've, we've absolutely uh, buried this talking point down through the years about the importance of, of goalkeepers but it goes without saying now that really on Saturday night I think that kills the debate about whether or not your goalkeeper should be coming out to contribute with play because Mayo were a man down. When Niall Morgan was in possession nobody was closing him down because what we had was an entirely man-to-man setup. Yeah. So nobody was going to leave their man to, to, to tackle the 15th man on the pitch. Well, let, Let's do that talking point with Anthony Moyles in a moment because there's one other bit that we've got to get to here in the performance rankings. Yeah, we're just going to uh, quick mention for Radicani, one of the, the great sports stories of 2021. Uh, if you're sitting at home after the All-Ireland on Saturday night, you were probably watching this. I think it was like something like 7 to 8 million uh, British people were watching this on Channel 4 on Saturday night as she won the US Open, started the tournament as a 400 to 1 outsider and never in the history of tennis has anyone fought through three qualifying rounds of a Grand Slam before winning the entire thing. There was just a slew of ridiculous moments about her path through this season, her path through this tournament, and it all concluded with an ace on the final point to win it in, in some fashion. She was ranked 150th before the tournament. She is now up to 23rd, and she won as a qualifier without dropping a single set. Now, winning as a teenager is not unusual. I think there's been three teenagers that have won majors over the last few years, but it's the way in which this particular teenager has done it which has been incredible because if we go back to Wimbledon, I think on the show we were drawing the comparison between herself and the English football team about how there is this ridiculous pressure heaped on you for no reason whatsoever except for the fact that you were British. And honestly, I wasn't sure how good Emma Raducanu was in during Wimbledon. Uh, we all now know uh, how absolutely phenomenal she is. Uh, Martina Navratilova says, nobody does it fast, this fast, this well. She said, her rise has been beyond meteoric. I've never seen it before. That is the truth. And what does what it say in the Telegraph? The Daily Telegraph, like, it's on the very front page. It's her lifting the trophy at the Champions Dinner. And it's uh, instant icon, Emma holds all the aces. You're like, yeah, fair enough. They're projecting forward. Champion Raducanu ready for anything. Yeah, that's uh, good to know. And then the third most important thing is, superstar humbled by the Queen's support. That's obviously very, very important that we get the mention of the Queen on the front page of the Telegraph somehow gooseberrying her way into the credit of the uh, incredible teenager who's just won. There was a, a line in The Guardian saying, even a rare message from the Queen, one ER congratulating another. So there you go, the same initials, uh, apparently. Uh, the headline on that Guardian piece was that she could become Britain's first billion-dollar athlete. So uh, no pressure to win loads of Grand Slams. Uh, you got to become uh, a billion-dollar athlete as well. Uh, they spoke to Mark uh, Borkowski, who has worked with Michael Jackson, Joan Rivers and Led Zeppelin 
who said this is the start of something. She's a billion dollar girl, no doubt about it. She is the real deal. It's not just that she plays extraordinary tennis. It's also her background, her ethnicity, her freedom of spirit. People also love the fact that she is vulnerable but laughs the pressures away. So uh, there is plenty of, uh, I, I would say, uh, fully patronising things still being said about uh, well, yeah, a, a US Open champion. But um, I think uh, I think this is the start of something special to be it's sure. five minutes past eight. That is this week's performance rankings. We're going to be back next with Anthony Moyles.